This is Adoption the Long View, a podcast brought to you by Adopting.com. I'm your host, Lori Holden, author of The Open-Hearted Way to Open Adoption. Join me as we take a closer look at what happens after you adopt your child and begin parenting them. Your adoption journey isn't over then, it's just beginning. In this podcast, you'll hear from a variety of thought-provoking and influential guests as we help you make the most of your adoption journey. Like any trip worth taking, there will be ups and downs and challenges. Here's what you're going to wish you'd known from the start. Ready? Let's go. If your main sources of information about adoption are from the loudest voices, namely adoption professionals and adoptive parents, like me, or maybe even your church or reality TV, if I dare say that, you may be missing out on key facets that would help you better navigate your own adoption situation and better serve your child. You can't see your own blind spots by definition, and you don't know what you don't know, which is why it's important to diversify where you get your information from. As you diversify, find and choose trusted sources, people with lived experience, people who also encourage diversity in their own sources of information, rather than from echo chambers. To that end, with me today are two amazing guests, two trusted and incisive women in the adoption space. Sarah Easterly, a well-respected adoptee voice, and Kelsey Vandervliet Ranyard, a well-respected birth mom voice. Each of them has their finger on the pulse of not only their own part of the adoption triad, but they also cross over into others, as should you if you want to better understand your child's experiences and your child's other parents' experiences and proceed accordingly with fewer blind spots. In the spirit of disclosure, I wanna tell you that Sarah, Kelsey, and I collaborated earlier this year on a widely read article called Common Ground in Adoption Land, which you can find in the show notes on adopting.com or lavenderloos.com. That article was so well received that we are now working on a book project about the benefits that come from listening to, understanding, and empathizing with each other, we on the path of adoption with our myriad perspectives. Let me first tell you about Sarah. Sarah Easterly is not new to this podcast as she was my guest in episode 106 on the topic of you're not my real mom, which if you haven't already heard, you will. She kind of tells us how, um, what that really means from the adoptee um, point and maybe some ways to deal with that with grace and ease. Sarah is an award-winning author of books and essays. Her spiritual memoir, which I had the absolute pleasure of reading called Searching for Mom, won a gold medal in the 2020 Illumination Book Awards among many other awards and honors. Sarah's adoption-focused articles and essays have been published by Psychology Today, Dear Adoption, Feminine Collective, God Space, Her View from Home, and Severance Magazine, just to name a few. Welcome, Sarah. I'm so glad to have you here again. Thank you, Lori. I'm so glad to be back. It's also my great pleasure to welcome Kelsey Vandervliet Renyard. Kelsey is the Director of Advocacy and Policy at Adopt Match. She's a birth mother who is passionate about raising the standards in adoption to better serve the children, mothers, and families affected by adoption. Kelsey has worked at various agencies and law firms in the adoption field and can often be found fervently and frequently begging the question, how do we fix this? She's also a co-host of the Birth Mom podcast, Twisted Sisterhood, along with Ashley Mitchell, whom we interviewed here in episode 102. Welcome, Kelsey. Thanks, Lori. And I'm feeding a baby right now. <laughs> yeah, we have we have her da- her baby daughter with us too, so you might get some uh, some hints of that, and we welcome it all. So, ladies, I want to talk start talking a little bit about coming out of the adoption fog, which is um, a term that we sometimes use in adoption land. And the way I see that that is when you come from a place of seeing adoption as only one thing, namely a wonderful, noble, something to be grateful for. And what was it like when your inner narrative began to be your, become your own and not what people told you adoption was for you? Tell us about coming out of the adoption fog. And I know, Sarah, you and I talked about this at length on our first, um, on our first interview. Um, so tell us what that is. Remind us. Well, for me, it, um, it's about just being able to um, look at all sides, like you just described, Lori, um, and being able to accept all sides. I think I always felt there was always a lot of um, emotion and turmoil brewing, but I didn't have the consciousness or the words to articulate 
um, what that felt like and where, I, you know, things would just rub me the wrong way or um, just sit, sit wrong and I didn't know why or make me very angry and I didn't know where all of that anger and frustration was coming from. Um, I had a lot of anxiety and I didn't, anxiety is alarm without eyes. I didn't know, I didn't understand. Um, I didn't know what it, what it was all about. Um, and so for me, it's, um, it's, it was for me, what, what helped me get through that is, is writing my memoir. Um, it was putting down on paper, what was such a private sacred process for me, um, you know, all of my, you know, up to the, the moment that I was writing all of my previous life experiences into um, words and trying to make sense of it all and the process of doing that and making room for it and realizing, hey, this is much more complicated than I ever really fully grasped. Um, and so uh, basically it's consciousness. It's, <laughs> it's not, it's, it was no longer stuffing things that felt inappropriate, that weren't okay, that didn't feel safe for many different reasons to share um, and bringing them out into the open and um, accepting all of it, accepting me. I love those points you made about um, consciousness and mindfulness and really tuning into yourself and making this your story, your literal story as you wrote your memoir. Um, and you also mentioned that it's complex. It's so much more complex than adoption is wonderful. Adoption gave you a better life. Adoption is only positive. So Kelsey, is that something that um, you experienced as well as a birth mom coming out of some sort of a fog? Um, I don't really know how I feel about that phrase and not because of its literal meaning, but just because of the way it's used a lot of times. Um, in the internet adoption community, I feel like it's um, kind of so binary. And for me, it's just been such a gradual process. And I, and I really think realistically for a lot of people, it is a gradual process. Um, it's this process of self-discovery and um, finding the reality in your situation. And, but I think sometimes there's such a, I don't know, people, people kind of use it against one another, like, oh, well, you're just still stuck in the fog. And, and so to me, I heard people say that, I guess, technically, when I was still in the fog, but that didn't really prompt me to come out of the fog that I was in, it really just took a lot of um, finding community and having empathy for the, for the people I met that didn't mirror my experience. And, um, it was a gradual thing for me. It, it, it's still happening. I feel like, um, you know, you're still, when I weave through my post-placement life and the grief, I, I'm five years out. So I'm relatively fresh out of this. And so there's still things I'm figuring out every day and, and how that relates, you know, to my life now. And I don't know, it, and I've worked in it as well. So I feel like in some ways that has made me speed up, you know, coming out of the fog and in some ways that has slowed me down. So I don't know. I have like a, a weird relationship with that. It's, and it's interesting. I love how you brought in a contrast to what Sarah said. Sarah's way of coming out of the fog was an internal process and your way seems to be more of a community process. And I think that just shows that there's lots of ways that you can make the story your own and tune into what it actually means for you, not what other people tell you it should mean for you. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths that we have in adoption and, and these myths that remain and perpetuate because we're not listening to some of the lesser heard voices. Sarah, can you give us, uh, maybe we'll go around twice. Sarah, can you tell us a myth that you think continues to exist because people are not listening to adoptees? What would they know if they were listening better? Well, I think, you know, one thing, this comes up a, a lot, um, and it's said to adoptees a lot, is um, that adoptive parents are, are some of the most selfless people around. I, that's actually a quote I've, I've had a stranger tell me. <laughs> um, you know, the conversation came up of what do I do? I mentioned I'm a writer and then, I, and I'm, a, I, oh, what do you write about? I'm an adoptee, I write about adoptee issues and oh, I know some adoptive parents and I just, they are the most selfless people around. 
And um, <laughs> uh, not to say, I mean, anybody can be selfless. Every parent is selfless to some degree, hopefully, right? If they're doing, <laughs> if they're doing their job well, they are, um, they're selfless. That's what parenting asks of us um, in so many cases. So to call that out specifically for adoptive parents. And what does that say about the adoptee who's adopted? Like if we're doing, if I am doing something so uh, sacrificial, what does that say about my kids? Right. The, all the messages that get absorbed by the adoptee, ugh, it's just, it's horrible. And I grew up with it. And, um, you know, I grew up in church settings. And so it's very rampant in the church. Um, and, you know, adoptive parents get the casseroles, they get the special preferential treatment. And it really does send some not great messages to the adoptee. Um, and to the first families, um, you know, which the adoptee is absorbing as well. So there's multiple, um, you know, it's suggesting how horrible the situation was previously. It's, um, it's disregarding the fact that in a lot of cases, adoptive parents are go seeking adoption for their own needs to be parents because they want to be parents. Um, and so that's not selfless, just, to, you know, to put it on the table. It's, it's about getting, getting needs met. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's just, I find that one quite problematic and it's pretty pervasive, um, you know, innocent comments, people mean well, they don't mean to, they, it, it's a lot, a lot of times just ignorance. They're not meaning to say something sharp and cutting, but it doesn't, it doesn't sit right in on multiple levels. So to counter the myth that adopt, that adoptive parents are the most selfless people around, we could reframe that as adoptive parents are no more selfless than any other parent with that. Yeah. Yeah. Turnaround? Okay. I think it's a great, great turnaround and, and not to call it out. I, I got, I have to say, you know, I, I have two children who are biological to me and um, I've never had anyone come up to me and tell me what a selfless parent I am. <laughs> so it's just kind of strange that, that gets called out for other parents. Um, and um, I'm not always self, I'm not, you know, it's hard to be a hundred percent selfless. I'm not, that is not me all the time. Um, so I don't know that I want that, um, being said to me, it might feel a little uncomfortable around my own children. Um, they know they see the places I have my own, <laughs> my own needs and that's okay. Um, I think that's the other thing. Let's just not call it out. Let's just stop. <laughs> Let's just stop with that. Okay, good. Thank you for that myth. Kelsey, do you have one that you would like to address that pe what, pe what do people get wrong about birth parents because they don't really listen to birth parents, perhaps? Well, where do I start? <laughs> How um, much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I have a couple in my mind, but one that really sticks out is that, um, especially when I see a lot of like younger adoptive parents or um people pursuing adoption, one of the things I see a lot is they're like, well, you know, we're going to do this open adoption because they, they view it as like, they're doing this nice thing for birth parents. Like this is a favor they're doing for us. And they're like, oh, you know, it's the least we can do to, you know, repay her for what she's given us. And they also, with that, I think it kind of blends into this other myth that it's like the need for these um, birth parents um, has been fulfilled the day she gave birth and signed the papers over to you. Um, the truth is that a lot of adoptees need us later, um, whether it's to answer questions or there's a whole, you know, spectrum of things that they could need. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that adoptive parents can't provide. And so, our role in this adoption um, doesn't just end at the hospital or you know wherever the consent was signed. Um, this open adoption is a relationship, and it's a relationship that needs um, work, <laughs> like any other relationship does, but probably a little more work because you're coming from a very different circumstance and. Um, and we, we're important, our role is important and it continues to be, not just for medical information, <laughs> for other things too, so yeah. I'm gonna make a confession here. <laughs> My confession is that um, when I was new on this path, like 20 years ago, I did kind of think that. I bought into that, that's what I thought it really was. 
And I remember thinking, okay, open adoption makes sense to me because what if we need a kidney someday? I want to know where she is. I want to find her or him. And um, that was like, what that's the frame of mind I had because of the myths. And you're right. I think, I think Kelsey, what you're saying that uh, there's no ending point in this. this. We always like to think that this is the end of a, the journey, but sometimes those endings are really the beginnings, not just for um, at the moment of placement for us adoptive parents, but for you too, there's a lot, your journey is not over at the moment you sign the papers. That's the start of a whole new journey. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that, Sarah, in response to Kelsey? Yeah, I mean, I was nodding. You, you couldn't see on the podcast, but I was nodding the whole time because it, it is so, it's so true. Um, just, you know, I'll speak to the adoptee um, mindset. Um, you know, I spent my entire life pining and wondering about my birth mom and it wasn't about medical information. I was really lucky. I had no health issues. I had not, no, you know, in, in some regards, it was almost um, not unfortunate, but I did. It took me a long time to go search for my birth mom because I didn't have a an excuse to pin on medical <laughs> medical information or needing that. Um, but that didn't, you know, that was more just out of protection and fear and worry for my adoptive family um, that I wasn't searching and stuffing my own feelings and not being comfortable because the truth was that I was constantly wondering about her and thinking about her and really needing, um, a connection and needing to know her and know who I came from, um, know my story, my origin story and, and so much more. So, um, absolutely. It definitely is, is beyond the kidney, (laughs) beyond, beyond the, the medical information. And I think if adoptive parents can figure out how to stop being afraid of the bond that exists between the birth mother in specific and perhaps birth father and their, and the baby, the child, um, if we can honor that connection, we all are better off because the, the adoptee is going to get more of that space to, um, to wonder, the, the, the birth parent is going to get more of that confirmation that um, things are okay in the family. And the adoptive parents have worked through a fear. So we're all better off. I want to get to some more myths. Sarah, do you have another one that you'd like to share with us? I have another one. And it's one I wrote an essay about for Severance Magazine um, called Not My Adoptee. And that is um, the myth that, um, well, not my adoptee, um, like, like the title is, uh, says, you know, I think um, I will speak to myself, but I also happen to know that this is quite common. Um, a lot of adoptees, a very significant number of adoptees grow up with a lot of, um, you know, sometimes trauma can look good on us. <laughs> a lot of traits that are trauma that, that may not be easily identified as trauma. And so for me, it was perfectionism. It was, um, you know, I was definitely an overachiever. I was always working really hard, desperately to be seen, to be noticed. Um, I stood out. I was a leader. I was, um, you know, always kind of trying to make a big splash. And and it was not healthy energy. It was a lot of neurotic energy going toward that. And a lot of it was to try to hope that my birth mother might find me and see me and that I'd stand out enough and I'd be good enough for her to come back and find. Um, But that's all, you know, on the outside, that looks like I'm just straight A student, getting extra credit all the time. I mean, it, it looks great. Um, I was very compliant. Um, for the most part, I had an adolescence where that wasn't always true, but um, which is also another thing. Adolescence can be very turbulent for adoptees. Um, but they, I had a lot of fears. I grew up constantly afraid, lots of anxiety, um, high alert all the time, um, nightmares, uh, just hypervigilant nightmares at work all night, just trying to get to a safe place, just um, recurring nightmares of tornadoes. Um, but these are all kind of hidden things, you know, it just looks like I'm a scaredy cat and, um, it, you know, just there could be labels that we're, we're missing something bigger and something deeper is going on. Yeah, and so I think there is a tendency when these these different manifestations of trauma don't look like a big deal, that adoptive parents can get complacent and not see it and not think that there's any that it's just, oh well, mine's okay. And the second piece of that is that adoption is a lifelong journey, and so it might be okay um, in youth, it might be fine, um, things might seem okay 
um, and the adoptee may not be talking about a lot of these dynamics. I was very tight-lipped because I felt a fierce need to protect my adoptive parents, particularly my adoptive mom, for lots of reasons, worried she would go away. I've already learned mothers go away. That was my first life lesson. And so doing what I needed to do to keep her close and what I needed to say to keep her close um, because I needed her. And so just a lot of those things can seem great. Um, and so um, it's a myth I don't, I, I say because I think it's important to know what trauma, um, what the effects of trauma look like and to be mindful to help adoptees um, and make space for that and not kind of further up and decide, oh, mine's good. So I don't have to deal with any of that. So what may look like a model child, a model adoptee may actually be a whole lot of inner trauma going on that the I don't want to throw your parents under the bus, but did they not know? They didn't notice? Were you that good at hiding it or were they that good at believing the myth or both? Yeah, I think it was both. I was very good. And, um, and I think my parents, you know, I, I, my, I should state because it's different, um, different situation, but I was at the tail end of the baby scoop era. My adoption took place in 1972. And in that era, parents were advised, oh, just take the baby home and pretend like it's just one of the family. Don't say anything. So we've come a long way <laughs> from that time. Um, we still have a long way to go, but we, we are, we were, we're luckily a little bit beyond that now in the education for the most part. Um, but, um, yeah, I think they, they didn't want to know. I think part of it was putting some blinders on and not wanting to know. I do think my adoptive mom knew to some degree, um, but it was hard to look at and, and just, not as many tools available um, in my youth mm. as she could have benefited from. And not, not as no adoptees speaking out. <laughs> um, yeah, this is new, this is newish and that there weren't adoptees um, widely speaking out to the degree that we are now. And, and listening to those adoptees helps us to not have the same blind spots that parents uh, in previous eras have had. So that's a really good point. Kelsey, how about another myth that you would like to bring up? Well, I definitely gave two away at the beginning. So now I'm like, <laughs> um, I, it's hard to pick just one. I think um, this, and sometimes I feel like, okay, is this too cliche or simple? But honestly, like birth parents are not a monolith. Like we're all very, very different. And the only thing I, and I know I used to say, or she's going to start crying now. Uh, the, what I used to say is always that, um, you know, the only thing we have in common is that we all chose adoption, but that's not even true. The only thing we have in common is that we all relinquished because not everyone chose it either. Yeah. And that can manifest in a lot of different ways, that sense of control and that sense of um, direction. And that plays out, that plays out later on. Um, so birth parents are not a monolith there's, yeah, there's gotta be a, a different experience for each thing, each person who goes through relinquishment or placement. Um, and there's probably a lot of, um, stereotypes around that. Sometimes when you speak out against the adoption is wonderful narrative, that, that, that kind of pat flat, um, description of adoption, you can get labeled as anti-adoption. And you guys both speak, you two both speak out against adoption is wonderful. Do you think that means you're anti-adoption, Sarah? I, I'm not, I'm not anti-adoption. Um, I, I, I don't think that means I'm anti-adoption. Um, it means that I care deeply about adoptees today. I do have a, a very, um, I feel a pressing need to help adoptees. Um, today with, with by, by way of helping their families um, no more. And I, I mean, I, that's really why I share. I, um, that's why I write. It's um, certainly not about exposing me and my, it's about, um, I want to help adoptees and I want to help kind of show where my, my journey has been and to try to shed light on some adopt, adoptee dynamics. So it's, um, that is my purpose is, is supporting adoptees today. So that's not anti-adoption. 
Um, I certainly, I, you know, the more you look at the industry and you study the history of the, the adoption practices that, and where we've come from um, over the last hundred, hundred years or so, um, it's, you know, it's hard to look at that and to not, you can't unsee it once you've seen it. And so I definitely feel passionate for change. Um, I think adoptions should probably drop uh, the number of adoptions should should come down um, if we were if we're doing everything right and right by right I mean reforming the <laughs> the industry and um, having better more ethical practices and um, then then so in that regard I get I don't, that doesn't mean I'm anti adoption I think there will always be a need for adoption there will always be adopt, adoptions taking place. Um, but yes, I'd love to see them cut down. And then the ones that, that, are, um, that are taking place, I'd love to see just a lot better, um, better awareness, better support for adoptees and their families. Yeah, that, those are good points that um, when you see it as such a simple thing, it causes some of the pain that you went through when you were growing up and you had to work through. And now to pay it forward to help adoptees that come after you, you want people to kind of see it in a different way. And um, I love the way Joyce, Dr. Joyce uh, McGuire Pavo sa says, adoption should be about finding homes for babies and not babies for homes. And that's where we sometimes go off track. And Kelsey, I'm sure you have something to say about this too. Do you consider yourself anti-adoption because you don't completely embrace <laughs> adoption is wonderful? No, <laughs> I think that a lot, of, a lot more people sit in the middle. And I think that's going back to your point about listening to the loudest voices, I think people on both sides can be very, very loud, um, you know, to each their own, but I just tend to sit more in the middle. I also am critical of adoption because I work in it. I, my life has been affected by it greatly. My dad is also an adoptee. His birth mom was an adoptee and I'm the fourth in my, um, the fourth generation in my family tree to relinquish. And so it's affected my life from day one and um, I'm critical because I care <laughs> and it affects um, my entire family. And um, really it's that I've seen the traumatic effect of it. I've seen benefit of it as well. Um, and I've worked with so many different women from all across the board that have needed this choice um and it, as sad as it is it's true our country does not provide enough resources or social programs and nine months is just not enough time to get your shit together <laughs> on your own without help and so it, it it's a fact that you know this has to happen in a lot of circumstances and um to criticize adoption is for me my intent is always to make it better, to fix the problems that we face and to preserve it as a safe choice for women. Because in my experience and in my perspective, as it is right now and has always been, adoption is not a safe choice for women to make. Um, Can you say more about that? Yeah, it's highly predatory. Hey. <laughs> She has a lot to say. Um, so as it is right now, the high profits in adoption make it a very, um, it's very affected by consumerism, which is, just sounds disgusting because it's our kids that we're talking about, but there's very high profits. They keep rising and it's allowed for um, people to see these gaps in the market where they say, hey, I can go make a couple thousand dollars off of this um, and then they'll jump in with their entrepreneurial spirit and they'll become a middleman with no qualifications but the way our um, statutes are set up it allows for those things and it allows for so many abuses and unfortunately adoptive parents are manipulated and taken advantage of in the area of their pocketbook and the mothers are manipulated and with the you know person that they're carrying and so it just becomes this big pay to play scheme 
And that's what we're witnessing every day. It gets worse. Um, the way that they're advertising now to get mothers is, is so competitive and it's predatory and um, it's scary. It's scary. And, you know, it's, um, I always say that your experience having the chance of being good is solely based on the luck of where you live in the United States and who pops up on your Google search when you go to find an adoption professional. And it's super scary to have a vulnerable woman out there at the mercy of whoever is at the top of her Google search because whoever's paid the most money to be at the top of that search. Um, and so really when I criticize adoption, it's so that it, it becomes a safe, a safe choice. And, you know, we also hear a lot from activists like pro-life, pro-choice, and they, a lot of people want to know, like, how do we get more adoptions? How do we do more adoptions? And really, it's not about doing more adoptions, but if you look at the numbers of adoptions and how they've gone down significantly since the baby scoop era, and even since, say, the 1980s, 1990s, you're looking at extreme manipulation and terrible experiences that mothers have had and people know more about it now. The transparency is accessible now. People don't want to do that. So if you don't want the numbers to keep going down, I say to like these type of people, then you have to preserve it as a safe choice. Um, and it's just not possible right now. Thank you for that, Kelsey. I think there's probably other whole other podcast episodes and series of episodes that can be done on that. And I really, really love what you said about how you're critical about adoption practices because you care and you want to maintain this as a safe choice for women who need this choice and, and remove the predatory practices. So I, I really appreciate that as being um, the, the good kind of critical. There have been a few um, high profile articles about adoption in mainstream media this year. Sarah, would you talk to us about what happened in March with an article in Wired that was called Adoption Moved to Facebook and a War Began? Talk to us about the article and then the adoptee, um, some adoptee reaction to that article. Yeah, um, you know, I hate to give this article a little any more airtime, Lori. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a very poorly written article, I'll just say. I mean, I felt like the whole thing was... Um, it was really centered around one adoptive parent um, who encountered what she decided was the anti speaking of, you know, you know, she, she decided this whole underground anti adoption movement and that people were name calling and certainly I mean we all know that. Um, Sadly, that just exists on social media. That is the world we're in right now on any number of topics. Um, and so the whole article I, I felt was um, flawed to begin with because it was um, it was just kind of talking about 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 that um, this this one. And she basically got took revenge and started going after some of these adoptees. So I think um, what bothers me, what bothered me about the article was one that it was poorly written, <laughs> um, uh, two not well researched, and three just um, yeah, I, I just ridiculous to put that much. It felt like clickbait, really. I mean, to we're talking about people on the fringes, really extreme views. That is that is not representative of the um, adoptees out in the in the in the public scene, writing and speaking and um, working toward reform that just isn't representative. And so it was irresponsible in that way. And it landed um, with a lot of fury from a lot of adoptees, um, you know, uh, just for, for a lot of different reasons, just countering, um, you know, just being anti, you know, what, what that means, you know, certainly there are going to be a few people outliers saying anti-adoption and they're going to have strong beliefs on that. Like Kelsey said to each his own, that's fine. But for the most part, you've got a lot of people very passionate about working toward better practices, more ethical standards, better creating better laws, ensuring that, um, you know, adoptees who come in from other countries have citizenship and aren't deported upon adulthood. Some things that are pretty much um, pretty pretty sensible, reasonable um, things that are needed in the space. So that doesn't mean you're anti-adoption. And so the article, like I said, I just hate to give it any more airtime because it didn't. It just felt like a, a clickbait sort of 
sort of piece on on a very uh, you got you've got someone who you know some people who are very strong willed and then you've got the adoptive parent who's coming after them um, in a really strong willed way. It was just kind of a it was like watching a bad reality TV show. So it, it didn't go into any of the complexity, just kept with a simple um, trope that that we already everybody already knows without any challenge to that. In fact, reinforcing it. Yep. Yeah. Let's go to on to another one. There was another one in June in Time magazine, and it exposed some tactics used by some in the adoption industry to convince women to place their babies. Maybe convince is a too light of a term. Kelsey, would you talk to us about that article and the reaction that birth moms had to that? Yeah. So I saw an overwhelmingly positive re, um, reception from birth moms just because we don't really get articles <laughs> written um, in a positive light uh, for us or really not positive, but like a credible light. Um, I think that credibility is such a privilege and we're often dismissed as, well, she just, I don't know if you really believe her, she's not really a credible source. And so we have to work really hard to be a credible source. And so for this article, I know the reporter worked super hard for over a year and a half on this. And I was really impressed with his research and just, it was very extensive um, what he wrote. And I know on the other hand, the professionals were pissed. <laughs> They were mad. Um, not all of them. A lot of them were like, yes, change needs to happen. I think the good ones were like, hey, this is a problem and we can't just keep ignoring it. But there were a lot of professionals that took it very personally, um, even if their name wasn't mentioned. And um, I thought that was very telling. Um, I just, and I even saw in like some Facebook groups, people were like not receiving it well, just kind of like, well, this this article basically is a repeat of something that came out 10 years ago. And, and I'm just like, why has nothing changed then? I, I just don't, I didn't understand that kind of thinking. Um, it's obviously a problem. And if it's not a problem that affects you, then a lot of people don't <laughs> seem to care, I guess, which I, that's pretty predictable, I suppose. Um, I really loved this because it illustrated the problems that are often such a secret. Um, I think the industry operates it with their two different audiences very secretively, very privately. Um, they have a social worker that works with the mother or a social worker that works with the family, and then they play telephone. And so I think for adoptive parents, what you could take away from this article is that this is a glimpse into the other side. It may not have happened exactly like the article said, but there are a lot of similar trends um, that are very widespread. And it showed you what working with like a facilitator who's not licensed, not regulated, no oversight for them, how they are treating birth moms and expectant moms. And it was just really, I think it's a window in to see what is the adoption process, the same one you're walking through, what is it like on the other side for her? Um, because there is a lot of coercion that comes naturally with the process of adoption because the way our system is set up. And then there are a lot of professionals that take that extra step and put the pressure on even more so. So I personally, <laughs> liked this article, didn't like the content. It was obviously a lot of disturbing material, but I, I do appreciate um, the time and care that was put in to bring um, the adoption process um, through a clear window for people to see and what it's like for us, so. I think in, in both, in the cases of both articles, it was whose voice, whose voice is bring, being brought forward. And in the show notes, we will have links to both of those articles, as well as some response to them. And Kelsey, if I recall, you and Ashley Mitchell did a, um, a, a response podcast episode on Twisted Sisterhood. So we'll include that link in the show notes too. 
Well, I'm, I, I always get sad because I have lots more <laughs> that I want to cover, but we're, we're at the last question now. And this is a question I'm asking of all guests this season. From your perspective in the adoption triad, Sarah, what do you think people need to know to adopt well and to adoptive parent well? What did I say last time, Lori? <laughs> <laughs> it's in my roundup episode 12. Um, yeah, I mean, is it okay to say something different? Or um, yeah, I think um, to adopt, yeah, to adopt well and to adopt a parent well. I think um, to adopt well, no. I mean, if if you haven't adopted yet, know what, know what, know everything you can. Study, study adoption. Listen to voices from all of us um, here. You know, to absorb the information, learn, um, learn. Go in with your eyes open because I think a lot of um, a lot of times we don't have that opportunity still, and I don't know why, but we um, get wrapped up and you're kind of learning as you go, which is you know, some part of that is the parenting journey. So um, it's not to say that it's hopeless if that's where <laughs> you find yourself. But um, once you find yourself there, then get in that place, get in that learning and being open and um, and and being open to to see to really seeing, even if it hurts, um, because it's it's not always pretty. Um, it's not a pretty package. It's not always, um, that wonderful, beautiful story. So be okay with that and just get, start getting comfortable with the discomfort and, um, and, and the complexity that might be what I said last time. I don't remember, but <laughs> yeah, that's ringing a bell and it's really eternal evergreen advice. Really. Kelsey, how about you as a, as a birth parent, what do you think people need to know to adopt well and to adopt a parent? Well, um, to adopt well, I really think that you need to seek transparency at every turn and do your research. I think that you can take your research outside of even just adoption and get into things like, I, I think that you should kind of radicalize yourself in a way and, and do your research on things like classism, racism, things like that. And, and then, then when you are ready to focus in on adoption, listen to voices that you haven't listened to before that you would have never thought to listen to before. Um, widen your perspective and, and embrace um, empathy, get used to that because that is gonna be a lifelong process for you. And um, to parent well, that's great. I would love tips to parent well. Um, to adoptive parent well, I, I think keeping an open mind, it sounds so simple, but it is tough and um, approaching every milestone with an open heart and open mind and um, get ready for just, you'll be so much more ready for anything that adoptive parenting throws at you and your child will um, be able to be received well with whatever they bring you as well, so. Well, you're speaking my language when you mention openness as one of the key ingredients. And I also love what you said about transparency, because, you know, when an article like that Time Magazine one comes out and adoptive parents are reading it, and if they were to find their agency in it as one that you was using coercive practices, I think that would be so very hard to come to terms with that you participated in something that was unethical. So the way to avoid that is to do your due diligence on the front end instead of later so if you get this message in time, people, do, do your investigative and investigations and, and look for transparency and continue with transparency and openness. So I think that's all wonderful tips and insights from you both. Sarah and Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate how you've shared your perspectives. Thank you, Lori. Special thanks to Adopting.com for producing and sponsoring this podcast. With each episode of Adoption, The Long View, we bring you guests who expand your knowledge of adoptive parenting. Please subscribe, give this episode a rating, and share with others who are on the journey of adoptive parenting. Thanks to each of you for tuning in and investing in your adoption's long view. May you meet everything on your road ahead with confidence, capability, and compassion.